I'm encouraged to know that many times what you read in the Gospels is of Jesus answering questions that people asked him. And there's a lot of instruction that we get from those answers. Jesus is always ready to answer questions, but sometimes he never answered. I don't know whether you've noticed that as well. Uh, because they were asking with either with a wrong motive or it was not something that he felt required an answer. So there are two types of questions we usually get in question and answer sessions. One is questions related to the tree of life and the other is questions related to the tree of knowledge. I don't want to go near the tree of knowledge. I want to go to the tree of life. There are questions you ask which are for information. What does this verse mean? It's got nothing to do with your overcoming sin or your daily life. It's just for to get some information. And I don't waste my time around that. I don't go to the tree of knowledge at all. The tree of life, you're interested in living a godly life. Those are the questions we answer. The others are not important. Okay. One question is, how do I receive God's infinite love? You've got to believe what the Bible says. I believe the Bible is God's word because in 57 years that I've studied it, it's changed my life completely. It's given me comfort. I've never found any contradiction, moral contradiction in the entire Bible. And I found an answer to all of life's problems that I've faced in these 57 years in this book. And I'm not saying that I know everything. There are a lot of things I recognize because my, all of us are limited human understanding. We can't fully understand. That also I accept. But people ask me, then how did you first begin to believe the Bible is God's word when you were first converted? Well, in those early years of my conversion, I couldn't speak from experience, obviously. But one thing I noticed, that now and then, I would meet some really godly people whom I could obviously see. There's a man who knows God. And in every, there were not many, maybe less than those I can count on 10 fingers. But every time I met a really godly man, I found two things about that man. One was he believed the Bible to be the word of God from cover to cover. And second, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Every single case. So I said, well, Right now, there's no way for me to prove that the Bible is the word of God. I'm just a new believer. Today, I can speak from experience, but then I couldn't. But all these people I respect seem to be people who really believe the scriptures is God's word. And so that must be a major part of what changed their life. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So, and when I spoke to them, they told me how they experienced the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So I began to seek for those things. So when you open your heart to God's word and you believe that the Bible says, there's one verse that changed my life. John 17, 23. The Father loves me just like he loved Jesus. I meditated on that and I found tremendous comfort in that. I mean, I always knew God is a God of love, but the extent of his love, as much as he loved Jesus, is amazing. And I said, Lord, I want to rest in that love all my days. If you accept it, you can receive it. How can I know when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit? The clearest proof is what Jesus himself said. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you. I need power for two things. One is power to live a godly life. And the other is power to serve God. So when Jesus said you shall receive power to be my witnesses, not bear witness. There's a difference between bearing witness and being a witness. Some people think Jesus said you'll have power to bear witness to me. Read it carefully. You'll have You'll receive power to be my witness. To be means your life first and then your words. So when the Holy Spirit fills me, I will have power first of all to be a witness for Jesus by my life. That my character and my behavior will reflect more and more the life of Christ. In other words, my life becomes a witness for Christ. And then also with my words, I'll have boldness to be a witness for Christ. That to me is the primary mark of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Not the gift of tongues. That's something God gives to some people. It's a genuine gift. He gives to some people. 
but 95% of what I've heard in Pentecostal churches is counterfeit. It's just a babbling of few syllables up and down. That is not tongues. Don't be deceived by it. I've spoken in tongues for 40 years, and for me, it's a language. You know, for example, if you see here, somebody speaking here in Chinese or Russian, even though you don't understand a word of it, you'll know the man speaking a language. He's not babbling two, three syllables back and forth. So what I hear in a lot of Pentecostal churches is two, three syllables, they babble back and forth and call it tongues. That's not tongues. That's not my experience anyway. And even though it may begin like that, like a little child, it's a language that by which we communicate from our heart to God. But don't seek for it. I never sought for it. If God gives it to you, take it. If he doesn't give it to you, forget it. But don't be fooled by all that you see around you. Seek for power to be a witness for Christ by your life and your words. And, and ask God to give you an assurance. Lord, I want to be sure that I'm filled with the Spirit. How do you know if the Lord has favor over the decisions you made in your life? Well, I believe that if we have made the right decisions, we will become more Christ-like. We'll overcome sin more and more. And very often we think of decisions in relation to what job I take or what person I marry. Very often we have taken those decisions either when we are unconverted or when we were very immature, it doesn't matter. Because those are not the major decisions in life. The major decisions in life are when I deny myself and take up the cross to follow Jesus, whoever I married and whatever job I took in my unconverted days. Those things you can't change sometimes. But you can change deciding to die to yourself every day and follow Jesus wherever you are. And that will change your life. And very often it can change your marriage partner as well. And so we have to be very careful once you come to Christ that you seek the Lord for the decisions you make and uh, leave it to the Lord. Sometimes we know analyzing, is that right, is that wrong, or wrong, doesn't help. It leads you into a lot of bondage. Forget about the decisions you made in the past. Say, Lord, I don't know whether they were right or wrong, but from now onwards, I want to take up my cross every day, die to myself and follow you. Like I said, when he, in Romans 6, 11, it's not just die to yourself. Because if you die to yourself in every situation, you'll be like a doormat. Some people think that Christianity means I'm just like a doormat, let people walk all over me. No. It says die to yourself, consider yourself dead and alive in Christ. So think of death and resurrection. So like I said when I was talking on that verse, I think how will a dead man react, question number one, Question number two, how would Christ react? Paul said, it is no longer I, that's one, but Christ lives in me. So think of that positive part as well. Christ was not a doormat. When people slapped him, he didn't just lie there and say, do what you like. He asked him a question, why do you slap me? And when they kept on slapping him, then of course he didn't fight back. So it, it doesn't mean in your place of work, you've got to be a doormat and let people run or walk all over you. That's not Christianity. No, we deny ourselves, but... We can stand up for our rights. You know, when Paul was taken to a court, he said, I appeal to Caesar. I believe I have a right to go to Caesar. And the, the judge said, yeah, you have a right. Go ahead. Another time he said, I'm a Roman citizen. You can't treat me like this in Philippi. And the magistrate himself came and released Paul Arges. We can ask for our rights. So dying to ourselves doesn't mean we don't have any rights in this world. If you are entitled to certain rights as a citizen of the U.S. or... I mean, you can ask for it wherever you are. And if you're working in an office and the cost of living has gone up, you can certainly ask for a raise in your salary. Say, cost of living has gone up. Or if things are going wrong in your office, you can go to your boss and say, hey, there's certain things which I'd like to share with you, some problems here. Can you do something about it? There's nothing wrong in that. It's not being a doormat. But it's not fighting. We don't fight, but we can certainly express our convictions and our desires. Jesus was not a doormat. So it's the way Christ would speak in a certain situation graciously and we can ask for our rights certainly. Do new temptations that you face in life mean that you are not where the Lord wants you to be? No. In fact, temptation may be an indication that you are where the Lord wants you to be. Particularly if the temptations become stronger. You know, when you go from second grade to third grade, the examinations are tougher. And as you go up, the examinations get tougher and tougher and tougher. So the Christian life is a growth where God does not allow us to be tested beyond our ability, but he will allow us to be tested to the limit of our ability. And then when I get past that, 
my strength goes up so when you face a really tough situation and you're a whole hearted child of god do you know that that tough situation is an indication of god's confidence in you say hey god trust you to go through this which looked impossible it's not impossible with the grace of god you can overcome it so when i face a very awkward difficult situation i say oh god seems to have a lot of confidence in me to put me into this soup here to see how like there was a man of god who used to say like this i love the luxury of a tight spot because i like to see what miracle god will do for me there to get me out of this tight spot he called it a luxury the luxury of a tight spot think of it like that the way you look at that situation that god's going to prove himself to you in some way uh <clears throat> okay another question is what does it mean to pray without ceasing you see this is something that i struggle with as you know that many things i preach are not exactly what a lot of others preach people preach and very different but according to scripture for example when i was a young christian i used to read a lot of biographies where i read of people who prayed for 2 hours and 4 hours and i tell you they didn't encourage me they always discouraged me because whenever i tried to pray for that length of time i'd go to sleep on my knees and uh, if you're honest you probably face the same thing too and these testimonies of people who prayed for 2 hours and 4 hours i said lord i don't seem to be able to make it there's something wrong with me so i looked for verses in the bible where i was told to pray for 2 hours or 4 hours or and i found there's not even a verse which told me to pray for 2 minutes leave alone 2 hours so i said what is the bible what is the length of time i should pray for and i found two verses luke 18 verse 1 men should pray always 24/7 not 2 hours 24 hours a day and 1 Thessalonians 5 and uh, verse 17 uh, where it says pray without ceasing 1 Thessalonians and chapter 5 and verse 17 so these are the only two verses that tell us about length of time in one it is always in others without ceasing so both places 24/7 so it's not this 2 hours or 4 hours i mean if somebody wants to do that uh, okay that's fine but when i go to the scripture there's only one thing scripture tells me to do so i began to think how in the world it certainly doesn't mean be on your knees 24 hours because jesus was not like that and jesus is my example so i asked myself what is it i do in my life without ceasing it's not reading it's not sleeping it's not working there's only one thing i do without ceasing it's breathing in and out and most of the time without even realizing it I mean occasionally we may take deep breathing exercises to improve our lungs that's okay those are pictures of special times of prayer deep breathing exercises but all the rest of the time you're not stop breathing you're breathing all the time in and out and in and out and then i realized this is how god wants me to be there can be times of special prayer you know particularly if your lungs are weak they tell you the doctor says do some deep breathing exercises certainly needed and so we need special times of prayer but what we need to do all the time is breathe in and out and i thought of prayer like a telephone conversation with god so when i have a telephone conversation with god it's like uh let me give you an example if i hear you right now speaking to somebody on a telephone for 1 hour i will be able to tell you whether you're speaking to a more godly man than you are than you or to a younger brother how will i know if it is to a more godly man you will listen more and speak less right or wrong if it is a younger brother you will speak more and listen less very simple principle so if you treat god like a younger brother you'll always be talking to him this that the other all the time talk 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 your prayer will be like that if you believe god is much more mature than you what will you do listen more this is my own interpretation of prayer and so for me i say god what is there i can inform you which you never knew about <laughs> uh, is there something i can tell you which you didn't know <laughs> what can i tell him what can i is there a need in my life he doesn't know is there when he says my god will supply all your need according to his riches and glory by christ jesus do i have to tell him he gives me the privilege of asking so that i can have the joy of answered prayer but it's not for informing him so all those things don't need to take much time i pray for my children i pray for my 
family members, it's all very good. I pray for elders in the church, it's all good. But much more personally, to me, prayer is listening. When I'm on the phone with God, I listen. And that's something I can do all the time. It says in Isaiah 50, verse 4, He wakens me up morning by morning to listen. And that's the verse that's been guideline for me in prayer. He wakens me up in the morning to listen as a disciple. And as I listen and listen and listen, the same verse says, when some needy person comes to me that day, I have a word to give him, to help him out of his weariness. Because I've been listening. And it's not just that I listen for 10 minutes in the morning. He wakens me up in the morning to wake up my ears so that I keep listening through the day till I go to bed. And it may be any time. The best example I can use is these walkie-talkies that police officers have in their cruisers, which is always on. Because any time headquarters may send a message. And they must be ready to listen to it. So that's the way I understand prayer. And that's the way I've sought to live, it, uh, live in it. And occasionally there are times, I mean, there are times in crisis in the early days in our church when my fellow elder and I would fast and pray for three days, holy on liquid, to seek God earnestly. And that means not on my knees all the time, but sitting before God again, listening most of the time, reading the scriptures, maybe listening to a message and praying and crying out to God. But to me, it, prayer is not so much speaking as much as it is listening. And I'll just give you one example of Jesus' prayer. It says in Luke chapter 6, it's the only time in the Bible where it says Jesus prayed all night. So let's try and see what he prayed all night. Luke chapter 6, it says in verse 12, it was at this time that Jesus went off to the mountain to pray and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And what do you think he was doing? A whole night means, let's say he went, into the mountains at about 9 o'clock at night till 5 o'clock in the morning he was there it's 8 hours what was he doing for 8 hours he may not have been kneeling all the time he may have been sitting down or walking around but he was communing with God and I asked myself what was he doing when day came verse 13 he called his disciples and chose 12 ah now I know what he was praying he was asking father I've got all these 70 or many disciples around me. Who are the ones I should select to be my apostles? And he tosses around different names before the Father. Remember, he had the limitations of a man. It was not as though God dictated to him. God doesn't dictate to us either. He allows us by the renewing of our mind to prove the will of God. So he spent all night in prayer to be clear as to who should be his 12 apostles. And it took him all night to be clear. So I think he was listening more than he was praying. And then he selected the 12. So that is my understanding of prayer. Uh, how can you make sure that God is an important part of your life? The only important part. How can you make sure you have the right priorities? Well, this is something very inward and personal. You know, I believe one of the ways we can know is the thing we think about the most in our spare time is usually what we are most interested in. I used the example of this rubber band yesterday. Set your mind on things above. The rubber band is fixed up there. It has to be stretched to the things of earth for mothers to look after their children, housework, etc. For you who work in factories and offices, eight hours a day, nine hours a day. And But once that work is over, it's released, it goes back to the things above. But as I said, with many Christians, the rubber band is tied over here. Is always occupied with earthly things and once in a while stretched to think about God for a few minutes on Sunday or some other day and then back to the things of earth. These are two different types of Christians. One whose mind is basically set on earthly things and occasionally to ease their conscience. They go to a conference like this or to some Sunday meeting. It's stretched and basically their mind is occupied with earthly things. The other Christians whose mind is set on the things above but they don't neglect any of their earthly responsibilities. They are good husbands, good wives, good fathers, good mothers, good workers in their office because they devote themselves to their work. Just like Jesus was a very good carpenter. I believe he was the best carpenter in Nazareth. <clears throat> but his mind was set on the things above. So that's how you know whether, where is your mind set on? That's how we know. Okay, another question is, as a stay-at-home mom, I often fall into impatience when kids whine a lot. How do you die to yourself in those moments and not act in frustration? 
how do you maintain the sweet water inside? Very honest mother. I think all of us have faced that as parents. Uh, our children are the professors that teach us patience, which every parent will acknowledge that, especially when they're small. We, and we need to learn patience. And those little children, boy, they're good professors who teach us that. So what I want to say is, there's a difference between anger and raising your voice. It's one of the first things I didn't need to tell parents. To raise your voice at your child is not anger. It can be, may not be. If you raise your voice at your husband, it's usually anger. <laughs> or your wife. <laughs> or your wife. But to, at your child, it's not always anger. And I'll tell you why. See, if a man is 100 feet away, and I say, hey, Tom, I'm not angry with him. I'm trying to get him to listen. And here's my son sitting here and say, I said, drink your milk. No movement. Drink your milk. Because he's 100 miles away, even though he's sitting here. His mind is somewhere else. Drink your milk. Oh, he heard it. <laughs> I wasn't angry with him. He was so far away that I had to just speak to him aloud so that he heard it. So I say, there are two types of English. One is the soft English, one is the loud English, and he understands that better. So that's not anger. In anger, there's a bit of hatred. You don't hate your child. You're just telling him to be serious about something you're telling him to do. Don't go near that cliff. If you didn't shout, he'd probably fall over the cliff. You're not angry with him. Sometimes we have to raise our voice. I just want to save you from the condemnation of thinking that because you raised your voice at your child, you were angry. That's not anger. Anger is something that doesn't go out of your heart. It's in the heart, basically. Whereas this loud thing just came from your mouth. You just wanted your kid to do something quickly. So that's one thing. And the other thing is we never come to perfection overnight. We have to work at it and work at it. It's let's press on to perfection, it says. We have a pulpit in our church. In the front it's written, let us press on to perfection. Many people accuse us, oh, you fellas think you're perfect. I say, no, read what's written on our pulpit. We are pressing on to perfection, which is the clearest proof we haven't reached there. If I say I'm climbing Mount Everest, it doesn't mean I've reached the top. Maybe I've reached only 10 feet, but I'm climbing. It's 29,000 feet up to the top. So in, when it says press on to perfection, it means I haven't got there yet, but I'm not going to be at the same level. I'm not going to be at 500 feet all, all, all my life. I'm going to move on to 1,000, 1,500. I know it's 29,000 feet up there to the top of the mountain, but I'm pressing on little by little by little by little and I'm progressing. Like it says, our inner man is renewed day by day. I want to press on every day. And the way to press on is like it says in 1 Peter 4, 17, if we judge ourselves first, that means I, I look at Jesus and as I look at Jesus, you know, like Isaiah when he saw the glory of God, it says, he says, oh, my lips are unclean. He saw himself. I don't look inside. I'll tell you honestly, I never look inside. Psychologists ask you to do it. I never do it. We are told to look unto Jesus and run the race, not look inside and run the race. You'll get depressed if you look inside because nothing good dwells in your flesh. So I never encourage people to look inside. I say, look at Jesus. Isaiah looked at Jesus on the throne and he saw his need. That's the best way to see your need because you won't get depressed and discouraged. I look at Jesus and I see how unlike him I am in a particular area and I say, Lord, I'm going to press on to perfection in that area. And I may not knock out this giant of Canaan in one blow. It may take a few blows. It may take a little fight. It may take a little time. But I'm going to knock him down. I'm going to overcome him and possess his territory. So here is an area where you're getting impatient with your kid. It's fine. Don't stop that. Ask God, Lord, I'm still impatient. I'm still getting upset or I'm sometimes angry. Go before God. Repent and weep and private before God. And you'll find gradually you overcome it. And don't get discouraged. But don't accept that status quo. You know, for example, I disciplined my children. All my four sons, I disciplined them because the Bible says a good father will discipline his children. There are various ways to discipline. It doesn't always have to be with the rod. There are many ways of disciplining a child by not permitting them to play games one day or something like that. But <clears throat> I have to admit that in my younger days as a young father... <clears throat> I would sometimes discipline my children in. I was so upset in anger I would discipline and I knew it was wrong. The discipline was right 
the anger was wrong. So I would always, <laughs> after that, go and lock myself up in the restroom and say, Lord, I'm sorry. The discipline was right. The anger was wrong. And I want, I'm really sorry that I lost my temper there. And I, I, you got to deliver me from this. I don't want to be angry. I want to discipline. I want to have complete self-control over myself. The fruit of the spirit is self-control and discipline without anger. And it gradually became better. Now you ask me, why didn't you apologize to that five-year-old child and saying, I'm sorry, I disciplined you with anger? Because he's not old enough to understand at the age five what is anger and what is discipline. If every time I punish him, I tell him, son, I'm sorry, he'll think this is a joke. So I decided that I'll give them a consolidated apology when they're 18 years old for all the <laughs> anger <laughs> I display <laughs> when they're old enough to understand it. <laughs> so I would go and repent before God and cleanse myself. And I tell you, it really helped me. I got over anger. First of all, be honest before God. Repent each time you do it and say, Lord, I'm wrong. I want to apologize. And if it was an adult, I would apologize to the person. Children are not old enough to understand it. But if it was an adult I got angry with, I would go and apologize. I've even apologized to people in our church who are younger than my youngest son. I remember once something was wrong with the audio system and somebody said this young brother did that who was in charge of it. And I went up to him and I said, you should be more careful with what you did. And afterwards I discovered he was, he was not at fault. Boy, how did I feel? I went back to him and I said, I'm really sorry. You were not at fault. It is, I took that word of that person and judged you. I'm really sorry. Please forgive me. So I've been very quick to do that. I remember once I walked into a bank to get a cashier's check or something and the guy told me to come back at 4 o'clock and when I went back at 4 o'clock in the evening, it wasn't ready. So I said to the manager, when the previous manager was here, he was more efficient than you. And I walked out. <laughs> <laughs> as I, this was years ago, maybe 40 years ago, and as I was going home, the, devil, the Lord said, go back. Go back and apologize to him. So I walked right back. I said, I'm sorry, sir. I shouldn't have spoken to you like that. I found the Lord honors you when he sees that you're willing to humble yourself and apologize immediately. To anyone you hurt, we slip up. But if God sees that you're really serious about it, I tell you, you will come to a life of victory pretty quickly. The thing that prevents you is your pride that prevents you from going and apologizing. So don't get discouraged. Keep at it and I believe you'll overcome. And a, between a husband and wife, if one is a cheerful giver and the other is not, I presume the one who's writing thinks you are the cheerful giver and the other person is not. <laughs> we always think like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, I don't want to judge that, but very often it's like that. What shall we do? Well, it doesn't mean that we are, as I said, we're not to be doormats. A wife is supposed to be a helper to our husband. And there's nothing wrong in lovingly saying something to your husband because he's not always right. Both husband and wife can be wrong. What does it mean to be a helper? A helper is one who corrects he say, darling, that's not the way. This is the way to do it. I mean, it's, if he says two plus two is five, it's wrong. You've got to help him to know two plus two is four. So in correcting a person, there's nothing wrong in it, provided uh, it's all a question very often I found in human relationships. It's how you say it. You can say, you stupid fellow, don't you know that two plus two is four? <laughs> you can say it like that. I'm just taking a Example, it may be something else you're talking about. Or you can put your arm around and say, darling, I want to tell you something. You know, two plus two is actually four, <laughs> not five. <laughs> it's a question of how you say it, very often. So, don't be a doormat, but share it, but with respect, both ways. Husband to wife, wife to husband. And there again, we press on to perfection. It's not going to happen overnight. In a moment of weakness, you may say something suddenly. Then lock yourself in the restroom. In the Bible, it says when you're angry, go and lie down on your bed. It's a very practical advice in Psalm 4, verse 4. Don't be angry. Go and lie down on your bed. Meditate. 
and then come back. Like I have a little uh, plaque in my sitting room. Uh, <clears throat> when you see someone else's fault, wait. Count up to ten of your own faults and then proceed. <clears throat> Okay, this is also, my husband often says things to provoke me. I hope this will not produce a fight somewhere in some home tonight where husband says, did you write that letter? <laughs> it's anonymous. <clears throat> and uh, I want to be at peace, die to myself. Is it wrong to talk about things that offend me? Not at all. I already answered that. We must be helpers that speak because your husband's not perfect, your wife's not perfect. We are to help one another. We are partners together, joint heirs of the grace of life. So if your aim is not to point out that you're better than him or her, then I never do the things you do. That's not the way to do it. But to say we help one another and say I make mistakes too. Please help me when I'm out of line. And we help one another and think both can press on to perfection together. It's a wonderful way to go. That's why God's given husbands and wives to each other to help each other. Instead, very often they end up fighting with each other. And that's exactly what the devil wants. So don't let the devil come between you. Okay, taking up your cross. Uh, if, is this a means of being filled with the Spirit or a result of being filled with the Spirit? <clears throat> you don't take up the cross to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me make it clear. Romans 8 verse 9 says, if you don't have the spirit of Christ in you, you're not even born again. You know it says that? You don't belong to him at all. That's such a clear verse that says that when you receive Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. Because Christ is in heaven. <clears throat> and you say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. It's the spirit of Christ that comes in according to Romans 8 verse 9. In the first century, they would say, believe in Jesus and receive the Holy Spirit. We just combine the two and say, receive the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the same thing. I'm asking you to receive the Spirit of Christ. When I opened my life to Christ, I received the Spirit of Christ, but I was not filled with the Holy Spirit. Baptism means immersion. And to be immersed in the Holy Spirit is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that may, may or may not occur at the time of receiving the Holy Spirit. So I urge people who are born again, who have received the Spirit, you need to be baptized or immersed in the Holy Spirit. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the illustration I like to use the most is, think of your heart as a house with, say, ten rooms. And one room is the guilt room. That's the one we ask Christ to come in because we are so guilty in so many sins in our life. Come right in and, Lord, drive out this darkness of guilt in my life. And he comes in. So you look at this house with ten rooms and one room is lit up. And I ask you the question, is there light in that house? Yes. Is the Spirit of God in that heart? Yes. Is the house filled with light? No. Because nine rooms are dark. Is that person who has received the Holy Spirit filled with the Holy Spirit? No. Because he's not yielded nine rooms in his life. So this Holy Spirit's like sunlight. If you put, close all the blinds and the doors and all and you pray that the Holy Spirit comes and he's not going to come in. Open the blinds, open the doors and the windows and the sun doesn't wait one second to come right in. So the Holy Spirit's like that. So I ask you, first of all, just search your heart to see if every area of your life has been opened up to the Lord. Every room. If you watch television, ask yourself, will you allow the Lord to enter into that room and determine what you watch? And will you obey him when he tells you to turn off something? When he obeys, will he tell you, will you obey him when he tells you to turn off those commercials? And not let your children ever watch those things, some of those dirty things. And, or the Lord may ask you, can I enter into your library, see what books you read? There's different rooms, you know. Can I enter into your uh, financial room to see how you earn your money? Is it all upright? How do you spend your money? Are you a miser? Are you stingy? Or are you generous? And if you say, Lord, don't, don't come in there because some things I do are not absolutely upright or 
I'm pretty stingy, I don't want you to know that. He already knows it in any case. But you don't let him come in. And then you say, fill me with the spirit. You'll never be filled. You can pray for a hundred years. Some people say in many churches, come let's have a meeting for prayer for the Holy Spirit. Come and pray and pray and pray and cry out to God. And they go through some emotional experience and they think that they are filled with the spirit. You watch those lives five years later, they're some of the biggest backsliders in the church. What is the experience? An emotional experience. I've seen so much of that in my life that I tell people in our church, go home, surrender everything to God, and in your room, ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. That's where I was filled with the Holy Spirit, right in my own room. And examine your heart and see if every area of your life is yielded to God. I remember a preacher seeking to fill, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and he yielded everything. He thought he had yielded everything until the Lord told him, you want to be a great preacher, right? That's why you want to be filled with the Spirit. You haven't yielded that up. And he discovered that was his aim. He had seen some preacher filled with the Holy Spirit giving a testimony. He said, boy, if I can be filled with the Spirit, I'll preach like that. And he saw there was a desire for honor. And he had to sacrifice that. And he gave it up. So there could be things in your life which you're seeking, which you've not yielded. Some friendship perhaps, which you're not willing to give up or something like that. You can't pray. If Jesus is not supreme in your life, you're not going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So it's after we are filled with the Spirit, the Lord Jesus says, now take up the cross every day. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to take up the cross. As a young person, if I'm curious, if when you feel an attraction towards the opposite gender, opposite sex, is that sin? No, that's not a sin. It's to feel an attraction is not a sin, but if you yield to that attraction in a wrong way, that is a sin. For example, when uh, the Lord didn't tell Adam and Eve, don't feel attracted to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. No. Because if there's no attraction, there's no temptation. Now, if that tree was full of thorns and ugly and smelly and all that, and the Lord said, don't go near that, Adam would say, no, thank you. I don't want to go that near, near that in any case. But the Lord made it so attractive and then said, don't go near that. That was how he tested whether something created would be more at what they would choose something created and reject him. And that's why the Lord has allowed temptation to be very attractive. Whichever temptation you can think of, there's something attractive about it. And that's the way the Lord tests. Do I mean more to you than that? Or does that mean more to you than me? Otherwise, it wouldn't be a temptation. I mean, you're not tempted to go and pick up garbage. There's no temptation there. Temptation means something has to pull you that's not sin. That's temptation. When I resist it, I'm proving to God, you're more to me than that. That thing you created, however pretty it may be, however attractive it may be, I'm not going to choose it. So the feeling attraction is not wrong. But you know, this attraction can start in early teenage years. And I've often wondered, why does God allow this sexual attraction to come in a young person when he's 13, 14 years old, and it, wouldn't it have been wonderful if even when we were 25 years old, we were like little two-year-olds, boys and girls playing together, even when we were 25. That'd be great. And then just before marriage, the desire comes up. That'd be great. But why has God made it that we get this attraction 10, 12 years before we ever can get married? I'll tell you why. Because God wants you to fight it, overcome it, be an overcomer before you get married. That's why he allows you to fight it for 10, 12, 15 years. Fight that battle. You'll have a much happier married life, a much happier sex life in your marriage because you fought and overcame it. So that's why God allows it. So, But feeling that attraction is not wrong. Okay, another question is, when you feel you're drifting away from God and don't want that to happen, what do you pray for? Well, that feeling can come, but you say, Lord, I'm slipping away. I want to repent. Seek fellowship with others and seek to read the scriptures and examine your life and see where you need to set things right. How do you strengthen your relationship with God? Just read the Bible and pray, yes? And also ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit and seek fellowship with other believers who are wholehearted. If you fellowship with people who are half-hearted, you'll become like them. You know how they say, one rotten apple can spoil a whole box of apples. Here's a nice big box of apples and you put one rotten apple inside, the whole thing gets spoiled. So be careful about the 
type of friends you have how to recognize god's answers well i believe that if we are praying for something you will know uh, when god says yes or no god answers every prayer let me tell you this but the answers are not sometimes we think god answers only the prayers where he said yes i always say god has answered every prayer of mine but they are like the traffic lights you know there are three traffic lights there's um, a red and uh, what do you call it yellow orange what do you call it here yellow and green red yellow and green red means god says no you can't have it it's an answer yellow means wait you can't have it yet you got to wait i'll give it to you later green means right ahead so god answers every prayer with one of these three answers and just because he said no doesn't mean he didn't answer see if my little son comes to me and say dad can i have this and i say no he can't go and tell mummy dad didn't answer my prayer he did he said no but very often we think if god says no that's not an answer it is an answer please remember that and it's a good answer because he knows that you you don't need it or he tells you to wait repentance is sorry how to rif- differentiate between a god given burden and a human desire well you can ask yourself am i seeking this for some comfort for myself or for the glory of god 1 corinthians 10 31 says everything that you do you must do for the glory of god even your eating and drinking ask yourself am i seeking this to glorify god because if i glorify god i believe that will turn out to be the best for me as well repentance is from god and why does he grant repentance to only a few repentance is offered to everybody he invites everybody to repent and he, it's offered to everyone it's like uh, to me it's like oxygen in the air Re- the offer of repentance is as free as the air that we breathe and if you block your nose and your mouth and you die you got only yourself to blame that's all i can say you can't say that god allowed you to die no that repentance was offered but you just refused to accept it is as stupid as blocking your nose and your mouth and saying i died well you chose that way so uh what should be my attitude to god so that i repent every day i already answered that look unto jesus see your need and judge yourself how can i believe in god more and more every day faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god so the more you read scripture the more you can come to know god because the mind of god in the only book in the whole world that explains the mind of god perfectly is the bible See I've got a book there which is a commentary I I took about 14 years to write it and 40 years to study it before that uh through the bible and the reason I wrote it was because it's about a thousand pages because in my younger days every commentary that I looked at all spoke to my head and I said lord I want a commentary that speaks to my heart that speaks about practical life in every book of the bible and to tell you honestly I didn't find it there may be some in the world but I never found one So that's one reason I wrote it so that people can understand the Bible. If you get a copy of it and you read 3 pages a day, only 3 pages. And keep a bookmark and read the next 3 pages. In one year you'd have finished it and I guarantee at the end of one year you'll know more of the Bible than you ever knew in your whole life because I've written from practical experience but practical living every day. So if you're serious about studying the Bible, that's one way to do it. And by the way I don't get any royalty out of that book. I don't get any royalty out of any of my books. All my books are free. And uh, more than half the cost of that book is shipping. If you want it cheap, come to India. It's cheaper there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my wife and I pray and pray for direction about our future, but we don't get any answers. Well, I already answered that. God will direct you if you both say, "Lord, if it's a particular direction, where should we go here or there?" Look for peace in your heart. Romans 8:6 says the mind of the spirit is known by life and peace. So whenever you're considering something, if you young people are considering marriage or a job or a move from one place to another, pray together with your wife or if you're just single praying by yourself and say, "Lord, please give me peace in my heart as I think of this. This person or this step or this job or this move. And if I have peace in my heart, that's an indication it's God's will." if i have a unease in my heart i would say stay away from it there's a book of mine there called finding god's will which gives more details on that uh 
Matthew 3.3, 3, it says, the, why does the Lord need a straight path? Prepare, make straight the paths of the Lord. That's just a way of making, saying repent. That means get rid of your crooked ways. The Lord, the, in Luke chapter 3, the John the Baptist's ministry was called bringing down the mountains, which is humble your pride, raising up the valleys. That means all the dirty things in your life, the low, low down things that you do in your life, lift it up. Make the crooked path straight. That means all the crooked areas in your life, straighten it. And make the rough places smooth. These are the four things he said. All different aspects of repentance. Okay. <clears throat> what if I might be the only one in my church that believes in the Holy Spirit the way Brother Zach teaches? Well, demonstrate by your life in such a way that people come to you and say, Hey, you seem to have something I don't have. And I believe that, you know, the Bible speaks of the aroma of Christ, the fragrance of Christ. You know, I, I sometimes sit in an airport and suddenly I get a whiff of a perfume and some lady is walking by. You, you, you know, they can be some distance away and these, some of these perfumes are so powerful that they hit you. And I say, a spiritual person is something like that. You live long enough close to that person and you see a calmness and a quietness about his life and he doesn't get upset or irritated and... He's helpful and he's always got a word to encourage you or strengthen you. And people come and say, hey, I want this life. Well, what's the secret? And you tell them, this is how you've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you don't, and then don't wait for the whole church to respond to you. Maybe one person. I always say, pray that God will lead you to one person. And then, then another. That's how a small fellowship is built. One, one at a time. Uh, what's more important to your church's input or what you sure God is calling you to if I have a different calling than my church has for me? You know, when you're young, it's very easy to think that I'm God's calling me for something spectacular. It's good to have some older brother who's like a mentor who would give you some advice. It's one of the things I've said in Finding God's Will. See what the Bible says about that particular point and see what older, mature brothers have to say about this particular matter. They've known the Lord longer and they'll be able to give you some advice. So you've got to be very careful when you're a young person, you suddenly think that this is the way God wants me to go. I'm more spiritual than everybody in the church. Just be careful. It may be true, but find some older godly brother whom you really respect and get his advice before you suddenly jump out of your church and do something and um, you could do something foolish. How does one relate the issue of women preaching with women like Jesse Penn Lewis? Now I have to say that Jesse Penn Lewis is a very godly woman and uh, she lived a hundred years ago and wrote some books which are very, very good. But she was never the leader of a church and she, she used to have meetings in little dr sitting rooms of different people and, and um, God gave her revelation. I don't say that God can't give revelation to women. If the Bible says women can prophesy in 1 Corinthians 11. A woman must veil her head and prophesy, it says. So men and women can both. Prophesy means to speak to people, 1 Corinthians 14, 3, to edification, exhortation, and encouragement and comfort. Even a woman can do that. But she's not called to be an elder, and she's not called to be a teacher of men in a church. So that I would not permit. I would not permit even a very gifted woman like Jesse Penn Lewis to be an elder in a church. But she can share privately with sisters or even with brothers privately if she's got some revelation on something. But it's a question of how it is communicated. A woman can speak in an authoritative way and that's not right. It's, uh, she's not supposed to have authority over men. But it doesn't mean she's got nothing to receive from the Lord. So that's, there's a balance in this in which you can sense in the way a sister speaks. Let me give you an example. Supposing a sister wants to share about what God spoke to her about anxiety. She can get up and say, you know brothers, I been, very often I used to be tempted to anxiety. And I just read one day in Philippians 4, 6, I'll be anxious for nothing. And I said, Lord, how can that be possible? I want that life. And I struggled and I would learn to give, commit my thing daily to the Lord and thank him. And little by little, I found over a period of time that anxiety went away from my life. Isn't that a good testimony? Now, another sister can get up and say, why in the world are you brothers and sisters anxious about 
anything. Don't you know the Bible says, be anxious for nothing? I used to be anxious, but I finished with it. I don't want to listen to such a sister anymore. <laughs> That's another spirit. He's talking about the same thing, but with an authoritative, like some prophet or something. And you sense not so much in what a person says, but in the spirit, whether it's the spirit of Jezebel or the spirit of a Mary. My soul magnifies the Lord. It's a completely different spirit. Uh, I'm worried that people I know may not be in heaven. Is it true that only born again believers will enter heaven? Well, Jesus said, he who believes in me has eternal life. I believe what Jesus said. But we cannot, I, I do not tell people where their loved ones went. I mean, if you were not, if you were a relative of the thief who died on the cross and who got converted just before he died and you had watched his whole life, but you were not there at the cross when he died. You would have been absolutely convinced the fellow has gone to hell. And if somebody had asked you, you would have said, Bye, I know that guy's life. <laughs> He's not in heaven. He's burning in hell right now. And you don't know the fellow entered heaven at the last minute. Because you were not at the cross at the last minute when he repented. So that's why I say, I don't know what happened to that guy at the last minute. So I don't want to determine where a person has gone. So don't prejudge something like that. You never know. Particularly some people, they may have heard the gospel and not responded to it. And you never know on their deathbed, they may have turned. Can a turn person turn to Christ just before he dies? The thief on the cross is the clearest example. So I don't make a decision on that. I don't tell people. And I say, just leave that in God's hand. Imagine if you torture yourself. Oh, my loved one is in hell, burning in hell, burning in hell. And finally you go to heaven and you see him there. You say, wow, why in the world did I torture myself thinking that he's in hell? So just leave that in God's hands. Okay, another question is, uh, when some people are weak-willed, and why does God make some people weak-willed and strong-willed? And um, strong-willed people always seem to get the upper hand, like Paul. Um, I like this. If this is an inappropriate question, I hope it doesn't offend anyone. No, it doesn't offend. It's not strong will or weak will. All of us have got a very strong will. I'll tell you that. We may say weak-willed in relation to certain things, but there are some people who are very quiet who are pretty stubborn. I've never met a child who's not stubborn. Every one of them is. We've all got the nature of Adam. The way they express it may be different. There are extroverts and introverts, people who are very strong in expressing themselves, and others who keep it inside, but the strong will is there. And that needs to be broken, the will that wants to do my own will and yield in order to do the will of God. So I can't say that I'm weak-willed and Paul was strong-willed. No, it's not like that. Paul was very strong in certain areas, but, and Barnabas was more gentle. It was a matter of temperament. And both were needed in the body of Christ. See, just like the human body, all of us are different. And there are tender areas in our body, and there are hard areas like our nails. Which do you want to get rid of? Both are needed. And so in the church, there's a balance, I find. So our will must be yielded to Christ, whether you don't find an excuse in saying somebody else was easier for him to yield. This is an interesting question. If my left hand shouldn't know what my right hand does, is it okay to fill up my tax forms with my offerings? What does that mean? That means you give your, uh, pay your income tax and count that as your offering to God? No, I wouldn't think so. I mean, if, uh, my offering to God is to be given for God's work, not to the government and income tax. Uh, anyway, I don't know if I understood that question right. Should a child of God defend his wife and children against any intruder who enters the house? Certainly, you need to defend them. You can't, particularly if they come to rape or kill the family or to steal their belongings by using a gun. Uh, even if this child of God knows and believes that God is sovereign, has total control over his life, this child of God has not yet come to such heights of faith. Well, I'm never going to tell you to use a gun on anybody. I'll tell you, in the Navy, when I was in the Navy, it's a military, I used to witness to everybody on my ship, everybody in my ship knew I was a Christian. And some of them would really tease me, not just call me, call me Holy Joe and all those names. They would tease me like saying, if, Zach, 
if you're in face to face with a pakistani soldier are you going to give him the gospel or shoot him what will you do <laughs> they're trying to tease me you know <laughs> so i said first of all i'm going to pray that god will never allow me to face that situation that's number one and secondly i would never want to kill a person i would pray that god will deliver me from such a situation and so if such a situation arises you know it's not a matter of faith there is a god in heaven and um, i believe it's right to defend our wife and children from being physically attacked i would not use a gun but i would pray that god will help me in some way in the name of jesus I, i'll tell you a true story there was a there was a brother in our church who traveled to another country he had to go for some official work and he landed up there uh, i think it was by bus or something early in the morning at 3 o'clock and he took one of these vehicles you know in these primitive countries it's a cycle rickshaw and that man took him somewhere in some dark spot a couple of people came to attack him to take his money or something and he just shouted out in prayer and prayed aloud in unknown tongues and those fellows got scared and ran away wondering what what is happening and then he could escape so there are ways in which god can protect us if we cry to him and they know that you are praying to god i mean you can pray to god in english it's fine so i would say that you pray to god but if he's only stealing i wouldn't get into a fight with him i say take it i'm not going to fight with you over if somebody sticks a knife in at your back or a gun at your back when you're down in the road and give me your wallet i say take it i'm not going to fight with him and argue over money in my pocket or my cell phone or my watch or anything we got to be wise in all these things and say lord what can i do i don't want to take a risk honestly and pray trust in god that he will help you in such situations um what does it mean for a double minded man james 4 8 to purify his heart that's partly what i've already said earlier that you got interest in more than one thing and christ alone must be center of your life <clears throat> some of these other questions are is it okay to marry someone who was previously married prior to being born again and uh put away his wife or husband due to adultery i never recommend remarriage for divorced people i don't even recommend divorce in our churches 40 years we've never had a single case of divorce i don't believe in it we stand against it we believe it's wrong and uh, if there are special situations i'd say each of them must consult the elders and see what is god's will in the situation but definitely i would never recommend divorce it jesus did say that if a person has committed adultery you are permitted to put away but permission doesn't mean you have to do it you can choose the higher higher road and say okay i forgive you that's a better way so i would not i i've told people that i will never conduct a remarriage in my life i would never do it if someone feels they should insist on it i think go somewhere else there are hundreds of churches that will accept you go to some court and get it done i'm not here to some of these i've already answered and some of these questions are more related to the tree of knowledge and i'm not really going to answer them um here's a question about someone who has grown old and not married i always wanted to marry and have kids but it didn't take place so what should i do you got to just accept god's will for your life and be happy and find your joy in the lord i mean if god did not allow you to get married don't be grumpy and sour about it there are many women who never got married to be a tremendous blessing to other people so just seek to be a blessing to others so that's about it um uh, let's pray and we can seek god now to answer the other questions which we didn't get the answer here heavenly father as we bow before you we thank you for those who are eager to know the truth and to find the way to you we pray you will answer the questions that were not answered and other questions that may come up you know that your holy spirit will lead us to all the truth please help each one of us in jesus name amen
Thank you.